One thing that's really nice about console gaming is that the hardware is representative of a specific era. With PC gaming, it's not quite the same thing. In my case, every new gaming PC I built ended up using uh, or reusing bits of the old computer for cost savings, meaning that my computer just morphed as time went on. But I have amassed enough parts to build myself a relatively decent period-correct Windows XP computer. Actually, I could probably do a Windows 98 or 95 computer too, but maybe another time. The aim is to play some old games that don't quite work properly on my current gaming PC. And I just want to have a computer around that runs Windows XP, to be honest. It's actually pretty easy to build PCs. It's more like assembly, really. These days, you don't have to worry about multiplier or frontside bus jumper settings on the main board, or even better, damaging Socket A or Pentium 3 processors because of their exposed dies. I'm so glad we don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. But still, Socket A processors are my favorite just because of how they look. Anyway, we'll be using circa late 2000s parts to assemble this XP computer. This isn't really a how-to video, but I'll explain a few things along the way so people who don't know what they're looking at can follow what's going on at least. Yes, I know, the sticker's crooked. Here's the case we're going to use. It's a Corsair 350D. It's way fancy for what it'll be used for, but that's okay. At least it'll look cool. Though it would have been nice to have a period correct case. It fits micro ATX motherboards, and already has two fractal cooling fans on the front I put in a couple of years ago. Some nice features it has are dust filters for the front fans and the power supply, and it has these grommets we can snake wires through to make sure everything's going to look nice and tidy. It has a pair of front USB 3 ports, which won't be used because the motherboard we'll be using only has USB 2. Older, as well as non-gaming oriented cases will have the power supply at the top, but these days they're at the bottom. I'm guessing it's due to better airflow. The power supply is overkill for the application, it's a 600 watt EVGA unit. It's actually a backup from my current computer, which is using an older 650 watt Antec uh, Earthwatts unit, I think. The wires are all nice and sleek for extra fanciness, and it has all the connectors for modern as well as this slightly not so modern computer we're building today. This is the motherboard, it's made by MSI and has the usual features for a budget board of the late 2000s. It has everything we need. SATA and IDE connectors and onboard gigabit ethernet and sound. It also has a PCIe slot, which is good because we'll be using a dedicated video card. The processor is an AMD Athlon 64X2 4600+, plus. that's a lot of numbers. We'll pair it with this huge cooler, which is a bit excessive, but it's really quiet and it's going to look pretty cool through the case window. 2 gigs of DDR2 RAM isn't ideal, but that's what I have. Technically, I do have more RAM I could use, but there aren't enough slots to shove those into. We'll see how it holds up, I guess, but I think it'll be all right for most games I'm looking to play on the system. Here's the graphics card we're using. It's an NVIDIA 9600 GT, complete with missing mounting bracket. Not sure where that thing went, but oh well. It has HDMI out, which is nice. This card actually requires a cable going from the motherboard to the graphics card in order to have sound going through the uh, HDMI port. I get a rig this sweet solution because I couldn't be uh, bothered to get the correct cable. The wires are out of an old case and just spliced together with tape, so I guess you could say it's got drift spec wiring, just missing the cable ties at this point. The paper is wedged in there to keep the connectors from uh, falling out. Since the motherboard only has one fan connector, but we have more than one case fan, we'll be using this fan controller. Basically, that just connects to one of the Molex connectors from the power supply. The fans connect to the fan controller, and the corresponding slider adjusts the uh, fan speed. Pretty simple. This isn't the hard drive I ended up using because this one turned out to be broken. I used some sort of three and a half inch drive. I can't remember the uh, specifics. It's like a 120 gigabyte. I think it's a Western Digital, but it's uh, perfectly big enough for my modest needs. This is the optical drive. It's a DVD RW of some description. And unlike the hard drive, this is an IDE drive. Personally, with IDE drives, I never set the jumper to cable select. I always manually set it to either master or slave. Since this is the only IDE drive, this will be the master, of course. And lastly, I have this spare LED fan for extra airflow out the back, but mainly I just wanted the light in there, basically. Here are the tools you're going to need. Nothing special at all, mainly a Phillips screwdriver. A flat hat isn't a bad idea to have either. I personally wouldn't worry about battery-powered screwdrivers or anything like that, but the convenience of them is nice. It's also always good to get yourself some thermal paste for the CPU, this just ensures proper heat transfer to the heatsink by filling up any air gaps that would otherwise be present. And also make sure to get rid of any static electricity. Some people use the wristband thingy, but I never use one. 
You can touch a radiator to get rid of static. Or what I do is just touch a metal part of the computer that's plugged in. All good. I like to start off by putting the CPU, cooler, and RAM to the uh, or onto the motherboard first. That way you're not reaching into the case. It's not like it's super difficult to do it that way, but why not make things easier for yourself if you can? First, lift up the little lever by the socket. Usually there's an arrow on the processor and the socket that'll tell you how to align everything. It should drop straight in if you've got it the right way around. Make sure not to bend the pins, so don't even ever try to force it in. Once it's seated, just put the lever down to secure it in place. Now it's thermal paste time. People have their own preferences on what thermal paste to use and how to apply it. I'm using some sort of deep cool paste that I think was a freebie when I ordered some stuff from Newegg years ago. It works fine. I use the glob and spread method. You don't have to use a fancy spreader like this. A plastic um, card works quite well as well. Others just do a dab and have the heatsink squish it down. I don't know what's better to be honest, but this is what I do. Mind the direction of the fan. In this case, cool air enters the front and warm air evacuates out the back. The mounting methods are different depending on what processor and cooler you have. This is a bit of an outdated design now with the clamps. With Intel, you have four buttons to push down on each corner, and I think AMD these days is uh, quite similar as well. Other aftermarket coolers require you to put a bracket on the back of the motherboard and stuff like that. It depends, but it's all pretty simple. Don't forget to plug in the fan power connector too. This would also be a good time to put in a new battery for your motherboard if it's old. The RAM is pretty straightforward. They only go in one way and make sure they're pressed down until the clamps secure everything in place. Now we can put the board into the case. Before you do that, if you have the back plate for the motherboard, you can push that into its hole on the case. Mine seems to have migrated, so we'll just leave that be. This case has all the proper mounting hardware pre-installed, so we can just plop the board into place. If that's not the case, you have to install motherboard spacers. Never mount the motherboard straight onto the chassis ever. Just make note of where the holes are and screw the spacers in. Put the motherboard on top and screw it in. Now we can mount all the other stuff into the case. First the fan. Again, make sure that it's uh, pointed the correct way so we don't mess up the airflow. The hard drive and optical drives are pretty self-explanatory. They've got their own drive base. Some cases like this one feature screwless installation. If not, get screwing. The power supply is up next. Some cases allow power supplies to be installed in any orientation. In this case, the fan should be at the bottom where it aligns with the air vent. This case allows for wires to be routed behind the motherboard out of sight. So grab your bundle of wires and fish it through the grommets so they uh, come out in their proper places. I usually start with the motherboard connector since it's so chunky. Newer boards like this one feature a 24 pin connector, while older ones have only 20 pins. Modern power supplies accommodate both. It only plugs in one way, so no worries about which way it's around. There's another four pin connector. These days, boards have 8-pin connectors. Again, modern power supplies have accommodations for both types of setups. The graphics card isn't exactly that stable without the bracket, but I never had a problem with it. It's not like I'll be moving it around all the time. The ghetto cable will be fine as well, I'm sure. New motherboards also have some sort of like 6-pin connector in some cases. Probably 8 pins by this point as well, but those cards usually come with some sort of adapter if the power supply doesn't have it. And the case wiring is self-explanatory. All right, it's all done. Let's close it up and turn it on. Oh no, my highly advanced lighting equipment has been revealed. After turning the computer on, I went into the BIOS just to make sure all the settings are good. Technically speaking, it's all right to leave most things as they are, but I like to customize everything the way I want it. For example, I always set the boot order to optical drive first, then the hard drive. And I make sure to disable the onboard uh, video card because we're using the 9600. I ended up installing Windows XP Home Edition, Anything from XP and up is pretty easy to install. Just follow the instructions, basically. I updated to the newest service pack, which is service pack 3. I also downloaded and installed all the newest XP-compatible drivers from the MSI and NVIDIA websites. Even though using an XP computer for web browsing isn't recommended, I did want to see how it performed. I installed a slightly outdated version of Firefox and things went pretty smoothly, except for YouTube. 1080p video didn't always play properly, and usually the image stopped when the sound just kept going. Not really a problem since I just want to play some games on it. Thankfully, the computer did much better in that department. The first game I installed was Oblivion with all the expansions and DLC. I'm running the game at 1080p, which is a higher resolution than I would have run at the time. I think I used a uh, 1280 by 1024 screen then. Frame rates are pretty decent with everything turned up to the max. 
HDR is on though, so uh, anti-aliasing doesn't work. I think it's pretty decent though. In dungeons and other interiors, it's at 60 FPS. A lot of the times, it does dip down pretty regularly though. Not bad though, considering what resolution it's running on. Overworld frame rates fluctuate even more, but it's still acceptable, I think. It doesn't go beneath 30 that much unless the game is loading a bunch of stuff. In towns, it's a bit of a different story. As you can see, frame rates are below 30 frames per second quite consistently. Honestly, if I wanted to play Oblivion, I would just play it on my gaming computer, to be honest, since it works fine on new computers. But I thought it was a pretty decent way to test the capabilities of the system. After all, Oblivion was one of those games many people used for benchmarking back then. This is more along the lines of what I want to use the computer for. Driver 1 works quite well with no hiccups at all. And this game does not work on my current gaming PC at all. This game is just as fun as it's always been. I didn't put an FPS counter on the screen, but the footage speaks for itself, I think. The resolution for this footage was set to only 640x480, but I brought it up to 1024x768 a little bit later on. I didn't record that, but it still ran just as well. Even at this resolution, it certainly looks much better than the PS1 version or Driver 2. Of course, I had to try the infamous parking garage tutorial. After four or five not very good tries, I actually finally got the hang of it again. I think this mission is still ingrained in my mind somehow. I also tried Need for Speed Underground 2. I had some problems recording this footage for some reason, so if it's stretched, I apologize in advance. And if not, then it'll look alright, obviously. Resolution was set to 1024 by 768 which I think was the maximum the game allowed. The only issue I had is when there's a lot of tire smoke. It really comes to a crawl at that point. But other than that, the game runs at or close to 60 frames per second for the most part. I'm amazed how well some of the engine sounds still hold up. That definitely sounds like a VQ. Overall, I think the build was quite successful in its intended purpose. I had a lot of fun just using Windows XP again. In fact, it's strange how familiar it is to use, even though I haven't used XP regularly in over six years or so. I guess I'm just getting nostalgic over the recent past, but nothing wrong with that. I'll try out a few other games over the next few weeks, and I'm sure I'll be having a lot of fun rediscovering some of my favorite games again. And the good thing is that if I, let's say, want to feature an old game on the channel, and it doesn't run on my current gaming computer, I can just record the footage off of this computer since it has HDMI out. And if you're wondering if Steam runs on XP, it certainly does. No problem installing it at all. Thanks for watching, hopefully you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again in the next video.